on Dirichlet spaces. Tom, please. Thank you, Gerard. So I'll share my screen. Everyone can see that, okay? Sure. Um, so uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so this is going to be a continuation of the talk from yesterday. So yesterday, uh, we uh, looked at some of the basics of the Dirichlet space, the definition, and we discussed boundary behavior, and in particular in terms of capacity. And uh, my goal today is to talk about questions concerning zeros and multipliers. So I'm going to start with zeros. Um, just as before, if you have a, a question, um, either feel free to uh, butt in, uh, open your microphone and butt in, or uh, you can ask in the chat. I'll try and keep an eye on the chat as we, as we go along. So, <clears throat> um, first of all, let's make sure that we're talking about the same thing. So uh, a sequence Zn in the unit disk, uh, possibly with repetitions, is a, a zero set for Dirichlet space. If there is a function in the Dirichlet space that vanishes on this set, but is not identically zero. And if it's not a zero set, in other words, if every function vanishing on the set is identically zero, then we'll call it a uniqueness set. Uh, this is perhaps a little, uh, um, controversial because I don't, don't insist that my function vanish precisely on the Z end and nowhere else, merely that it's not identically zero. But actually, at least in the case we're looking at here, it doesn't make any difference because if your function has unwanted zeros, then you can divide them out. And the, the trick is simply you, um, uh, you form a Blaschke product containing the unwanted zeros, you divide through by that, and that has the effect of actually reducing the Dirichlet integral of f. So the, the new function with the zeros removed will still be in the Dirichlet space if the original function was. So we can always reduce the case where the, the function vanishes precisely on the z ends. Incidentally, the proof that dividing through by a Blaschke product reduces the value of the Dirichlet integral, it's like so many things, it's a consequence of this fantastic formula of Carlson that I showed you last time. There are also more direct proofs of it. Okay, so <clears throat> um, the question is, uh, what are these sets? So obviously, uh, if, Z, if you have a function that vanishes uh, on a Zn, a holomorphic function, then the Zn must be a, a sequence that tends to the boundary just by the isolated zeros principle. Um, and uh, in the case of the Hardy space, we know rather more. We know that there's, if the ZNs are a zero set, then they have to converge to the boundary fast enough for this series here to converge. In other words, uh, the ZNs form a so-called Blaschke sequence. And this condition is not only necessary, it's also sufficient because if the ZNs do satisfy that condition, well, you can just construct a Blaschke product that vanishes on those ZNs and nowhere else. And that will be in, in the Hardy space H2. It will even be in the Hardy space H infinity, which is smaller. Um, so what about the Dirichlet space? Well, since the Dirichlet space is contained in the Hardy space, it's clear, I hope, that every function in the Dirichlet space will have zeros also satisfying this requirement. The problem is that the converse won't work anymore. You can't simply say, let's form a Blaschke product with the ZNs, because that Blaschke product in general won't belong to the Dirichlet space. In fact, I mentioned last time that the only Blaschke products are, that belong to the Dirichlet space are finite Blaschke products. Um, now you could try and get around the problem by multiplying your infinite Blaschke product by a suitable outer factor and try to produce something that's in the Dirichlet space. And well, that's where all the, the tricky uh, arguments go. I mean, this is, the, this is the, the real problem. So what's actually known about this problem? Well, there are, it turns out there are three cases. 
So the, the first case is uh, already from what I said, I think it's obvious. If the ZNs do not form a Blaschke sequence, then they're a uniqueness set for the Hardy space and therefore also for the Dirichlet space. There's no function in the Dirichlet space that can vanish just on the ZNs. So that's, I think that's easy. Uh, there's a second case, and this is a theorem of Shapiro and Shields improving a, an earlier result of Carlson on, in the same direction. So they proved that if the ZNs converge to the boundary sufficiently rapidly that this series you see here, one over mod log of one minus mod ZN, if that series converges, then ZN is a zero set. So this is a sufficient condition for the ZNs to be a zero set. Uh, now, it's probably not immediately obvious what this, um, this condition here, this uh, condition in the Shapiro Shields theorem is saying. But just uh, think about the following example for a second. Suppose that uh, Zn uh, is a distance e to the minus m from the boundary. Okay, so then one minus mod Zn would be e to the minus n. Log of that would be, or mod log of that would be n. And so you would have the series sigma one over n. That diverges. So even if the ZNs tend to the unit circle at a rate so fast that the distance is e to the minus n, that still isn't fast enough to make this series converge. So that the convergence of this series is saying that the ZNs converge to the unit circle really, really fast. So there's a big gap between this condition and the Blaschke condition. And the third case governs what happens in that gap. And there the answer is perhaps a bit surprising. So this is uh, a result of Nagel, Rudin, and Shapiro, again, improving an earlier result of Carlson's. So suppose the ZNs fall in between the two regimes. So they don't satisfy either case one or case two. Then you can find a zero set, ZN prime, and a uniqueness set, Zn double prime, that has exactly the same moduli as Zn. In other words, just knowing mod Zn is not sufficient to tell you whether the Zn's are zero set or a uniqueness set. And in this case, the arguments of the Zn matter. So this is completely different to what happens in the Hardy space where just knowing mod Zn tells you everything about whether you have a zero set or not. Okay, so I'm gonna to return to the question of the arguments uh, in a little while, but before doing that, it's convenient to, to look at a, another question. And this is the question of zero sets on the boundary. So remember, if we're in the, if you have a function in the Dirichlet space, then it has non-tangential uh, boundary values quasi everywhere, everywhere outside a, outside a set of capacity zero. And it makes sense to ask what subsets of the unit circle can be zero sets for this extended function, in other words, for F star. Um, now, if you compare the situation with the Hardy space, you might wonder why doesn't this question even get asked in the case of the Hardy space? Well, for the Hardy space, it doesn't even make sense to talk about subsets of measure zero because in any uh, function in the Hardy space, there is always an ambiguity of a set of measure zero. You know, a function is defined, uh, the boundary function is defined almost everywhere. So you have this ambiguity of sets of measure zero. And immediately you have a set of positive measure, it's no longer a zero set of, of the Hardy space. It's a, a well-known result that if F star vanishes on a set of positive measure in the circle, then F must be identically zero. And so the question of, of classifying the zero sets for functions in the Hardy space, the boundary zero sets, doesn't even arise. But in the Dirichlet space, it makes perfectly good sense. And in, in fact, it's a very interesting question. Um, so uh, 
Before diving into the Dirichlet space, I just want to mention one or two other spaces where this question can be answered, and the answer was known long ago. Uh, so the first example is the, the, the disk algebra. So this is the function of holomorphic functions on the unit disk that extend to be a continuous on the closed unit disk. And there the, <clears throat> the answer is very simple and very nice. So a, a boundary set is a zero set for a function in the disk algebra, if and only if it's of linear Lebesgue measure zero. So if you're given the subset of the unit circle of Lebesgue measure zero, closed subset, then uh, there is a function in the disk algebra vanishing precisely on that set. And that condition is necessary and sufficient. Um, if you look at the smaller algebra, A1, of D, so that's the, this thing here. So A1 of D is the set of functions such that, that are holomorphic on the disk, such that both F and F dashed extend continuously to the boundary. In other words, F dash belongs to the disk algebra. And there the answer for what are the boundary zero sets is a little bit different because um, if F is in A1, then because the derivative of f is bounded, f itself must be a Lipschitz function. And it's not very difficult to deduce from that that the, the zero set of f must satisfy another condition. And the condition is actually what's the one that's written here. So E is a certain closed subset of the unit circle. And what I'm saying is that if f is a function in A1, and E is its zero set on the unit circle, then E must satisfy this condition. This is actually very, very easy uh, result to prove. And Carlson proved the converse. So this is the theorem that I've stated here. Uh, so he showed that if E satisfies this condition, then indeed there is a function in A1 whose zero set is exactly equal to E. Um, and uh, because he did this uh, sets like this and now commonly called Carlson sets. Um, so just a word about what this condition is saying. Uh, it certainly implies that E is a set of measure zero, but it's saying more than that. Um, so because E is a closed subset of the circle, its complement is, is open. So it's a union of open arcs and the, because E has measure zero, the sums of the lengths of these arcs has to be two pi, that's easy. And what this condition is saying in terms of the lengths of the arcs is that um, if you call the, the jth arc ij, then the sum of the lengths of the ij times the logs of their lengths, so mod i log mod i, the sum of those things uh, has to converge. And so this is sort of saying not just, it's not a condition about the size of E, but more about how E is distributed on, on the unit circle. It's a, it's a kind of regularity condition. Okay, so what does all this have to do with the Dirichlet space? Well, um, if F is in A1, then it's certainly in the Dirichlet space because uh, F dashed, uh, if F dashed is bounded, then it's the Dirichlet integral of F certainly converges. And so a corollary, instant corollary to Carlson's theorem is that if E is a, a Carlson set on the unit circle, then you can find a, a function in the Dirichlet space that has E as its, its zero set. Okay, so is that, that's certainly a sufficient condition. Is it necessary? It was necessary for A1, but is it necessary for the, the Dirichlet space? And the answer is no. And indeed, there is a second theorem that gives another source of zero sets. Again, due to Carlson, and later on, it was improved by Brown and Cohen. Um, so if uh, in this theorem, we assume that E is a closed subset of capacity zero. And then once again, you can find a function in the Dirichlet space and continuous up to the boundary whose zero set is E. Now, uh, at first sight, it's perhaps not quite clear what the relation between these two theorems is, but I want to emphasize that neither of these results implies the other. Um, you can certainly 
of Carlson sets that are of positive capacity. So an example of such a thing would be the, the Cantor middle third set. That's an example of a, well, wrapped around the circle, of course, that's an example of a Carlson set. Um, and it's certainly not capacity zero. The, the can, standard Cantor middle third set has, has, excuse me, has positive capacity. In the other direction, uh, you can even have a countable compact set, which will certainly be of capacity zero, uh, which is not a Carlson set. So um, really the, the, the second theorem is a theorem about size, the constraint is a constraint on the size of E. And the, th the first theorem, the hypothesis is really a, a hypothesis, not just on the size of E, because certainly E has to have measure zero, but on the way that E is distributed. Um, and well, that's kind of the, still the state of the art. Um, I'll just mention here that if uh, E has positive Lebesgue measure, then E is a boundary uniqueness set for, for D because it, it is even for the Hardy space. That's, that's almost obvious. If you have a set a function in your, in the Hardy space that vanishes, its radial boundary limits vanish on a set of positive measure, then F must be zero. But what's perhaps a bit surprising is that there are uniqueness sets, closed uniqueness sets of measure zero for the Dirichlet space. That doesn't happen for the Hardy space. Uh, and an example of such a thing, um, you can get by taking the uh, Cantor, I think the Cantor middle third set will do, and taking a countable number of rotated copies of that and forming their union. And the rotations have to be just the right angles. And that ends up being a, a closed, if, you, if your, your rotations tend to a limit, then the resulting set is closed, will have measure zero, and you can do it in such a way that it's a uniqueness set for the Dirichlet space. So this kind of hints that this is not a, an easy problem to solve in general. Okay, so... Uh, Now I want to return to the question of zero sets on the interior. And as I mentioned, arguments play a role. And here is a nice theorem from uh, 1970, from Cochrane. Um, so to try and put this in perspective, the theorems we saw earlier were attempting to categorize and classify zero sets, characterize zero sets, in terms of their moduli. So, trying to forget what moduli will give rise to zero sets irrespective of the choice of arguments. And this is kind of turning the situation on its head, this theorem. Here we're trying to find what arguments will give zero sets irrespective of the moduli. Well, that doesn't make sense because the moduli must tend to one, otherwise the set might even be uh, discrete. And in fact, they have to tend to one fast enough uh, for this series to converge because we, we must satisfy the Blaschke condition. But subject to that, whenever we have a sequence of moduli that satisfy the Blaschke condition, uh, suppose that the e to the i theta n give you a choice of arguments that's always a zero set. When is that true? And Cochrane characterized such things. And the answer is really beautiful. You, you look at the, the set of e to the i theta n thought of as a subset of the unit circle, close it up, and the condition is that E should be one of these Carlson sets. <clears throat> Once again, just to um, uh, give a, an indication that the general problem is quite tricky. Uh, here's an example of a Blaschke sequence that's not a uniqueness, that is a uniqueness set, excuse me. Um, so, the series uh, sigma one minus mod Zn is just sigma one over n log n squared, which converges. That's a Blaschke sequence. But with this particular choice of arguments, you can show that the Zn's are actually uniqueness set for D. And well, uh, the end of the story, as far as I'm going to tell it, is that the problem is still open. This is a very difficult problem, it seems. A lot of work has been done on it in, in various ways, but this is still an open problem. Both 
zero sets in the interior and zero sets on the boundary. And uh, well, I just mentioned one other, one other development that I think is interesting. Um, so uh, I talked about A1 of D. Uh, you might ask what happens if you change A1 for A2? So functions whose first two derivatives belong to the, the disk algebra, what are their zero sets? It turns out that the answer doesn't change. Carlson proved that. It's still the, the Carlson set condition is still necessary and sufficient. And that's actually not too difficult to see. And indeed, the same argument works for a n of d for any finite value of n. And the next step up is to go to a infinity of d, which is the set of functions uh, holomorphic on d such that all their derivatives extend continuously to the, the closure of the disk. And here it's much more subtle because if you think about it, um, constructing functions with given zero sets means you need to find uh, C infinity functions. So function all of whose derivatives uh, vanish at, at a point, which is not identically zero. So you're looking at functions on the unit circle that are not uh, real analytic. And it turns out that the Carlson set condition works even for this. This is a sufficient condition for zero sets. And this is, uh, there are several papers that prove this, but the one that uh, I know is uh, a very interesting paper of Taylor and Williams from, from 1970. Okay, so I think that's what I'm going to say about zero sets. Uh, before I move on, are there any questions? I see there was one question in the chat, which I've answered. Um, is there a conjecture for the zero set of Dirichlet spaces? Um, not that I know of. I think that's, there's not even, a, maybe someone else can correct me, but I'm not sure there's even a, a plausible candidate for what the right answer should be. Tom, um, I have a question. Yes. Um, did, did you say that uh, uh, a zero set for A infinity of D on the boundary not only the function is zero, but all of its derivatives are zero? Yes. Well, because if, if the function, well, if the set, okay, so suppose the set, um, take a point in the set that's not an isolated point. Um, uh, then um, obviously the function itself must vanish at, at this, at this point. So take a point in that set that's not isolated. The function itself must vanish at that point. But since there's a sequence of other points tending to oh, that yeah. point where the function <laughs> vanishes, its derivative must vanish as I well, <laughs> and, and so on and so forth. So all the derivatives will vanish. I see. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's head on to the next uh, chapter, and this is on multipliers. Uh, so these uh, were already mentioned in Jonathan's talk yesterday. Uh, so the very first remark to be made is that the, the Dirichlet space is, is not an algebra. So the product of two functions in the Dirichlet space need not again, need, doesn't necessarily have to be in the Dirichlet space. It's not that difficult to construct explicit examples, but I'm going to show you a, an abstract argument because it's useful for something else that will come later. So here's one of my very few proofs. So suppose it were an algebra, uh, then there's a fairly easy argument involving the closed graph theorem to show that multiplication uh, has to be jointly continuous with respect to the norm. And so D would be isomorphic to a Banach algebra. The, the norm doesn't have to be Submultiplicative, but it would have to be submultiplicative up to a constant. And once you have something that's isomorphic to a Banach algebra, uh, well, you can consider the spectrum of an element, and it will always be a compact set. And for each z in the open unit disk, evaluation at z is a character on this algebra. And so, just by the general theory of Banach algebras, the, the value of this character at f has to be. Uh, in modulus bounded by the spectral radius of f. And that works for each and every character. So it works for all z in the unit disk. In other words, f itself 
must be a bounded function. And one of the very first things I showed you yesterday was that not every function in the Dirichlet space is bounded. So there we go. But if you don't like that, it's actually a nice little exercise to, to construct an explicit f who's in the disk algebra whose square is not in the disk algebra. Okay, so it's not an algebra. Um, but so once you have something that's not an algebra, it's sort of natural to look at so-called multipliers. So a multiplier is a, a function with the property that multiplication by that function leaves you in the algebra. So whenever f lies in d, phi f also belongs to d. And it's easy to see that uh, the family of multipliers forms an algebra. And in fact, it's a Banach algebra with respect to the multiplier norm. Uh, I'm not sure if I've written that somewhere, but anyway, the, uh, you can add, if you think of the operation of multiplication by phi as an operator on D, by the closed graph theorem, it's a bounded linear operator. And the operator norm of that operator is the so-called multiplier norm of phi. And was, with respect to that norm, the multipliers form a Banach algebra. So you can do this, in fact, for any uh, function space. And in the case of the Hardy space, um, it's very easy to uh, identify what the multiplier algebra is. Uh, it's H infinity. Multiplication by a bounded holomorphic function leaves you inside H2. And it's not very hard to convince yourself that these are the only uh, possible multipliers. So what about the Dirichlet space? What are the multipliers there? Um, well, there's a, a necessary condition. Actually, there are two necessary conditions. The first one is very easy because if uh, phi is a multiplier, then in particular, multiplying the constant function one, which is certainly in the Dirichlet space, by phi must leave you in the Dirichlet space. So phi itself has to be in the Dirichlet space, no choice. And not only that, but phi has to be bounded. And actually it's almost the same argument that I gave you just a moment ago. The, the algebra of multipliers is a Banach algebra and evaluation at any point of the unit disk is a character on that algebra. And so if you evaluate phi at any point, the, the result has to be bounded by the, the spectral radius of phi in this multiplier algebra. And so phi itself must be a bounded function. So if I put these two conditions together, you get just one necessary condition, which is that phi, uh, if it's a multiplier, it must belong to the intersection of, the, of D with H infinity. And actually this D intersect H infinity, it's, uh, it's, it's itself a Banach algebra, and it's quite easy to check. And you could be forgiven for thinking that this necessary condition is also sufficient. It's, it's a very plausible um, thing, but it's false. Uh, and I haven't included uh, an example, but you can construct a very explicit example of a phi that lies in this intersection and an f in the Dirichlet space with a property that when you multiply the two together, you're no longer in the Dirichlet space. It's a, it's a direct calculation, a rather messy one. But I just ask you to believe me that this necessary condition is actually not sufficient. There is a very easy sufficient condition, which is that phi prime should be bounded. That's just a very direct check. But in order to uh, characterize completely uh, multipliers, we'd like to have a necessary and sufficient condition. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, another notion, which uh, turns out to be useful for all sorts of other things as well. So it's well worth doing. And um, it's that man, Carlson again, uh, Carlson measure. So I'll explain uh, uh, on the next slide where Carlson himself comes into this, but here is the definition. So um, a measure on the unit disk is a positive measure, is a Carlson measure for the Dirichlet space if there exists a constant C with a property that the, for any function in the Dirichlet space, the L2 norm of F with respect to this measure is controlled by the, the Dirichlet norm of F. Uh, 
Uh, another way, actually, an equivalent way of saying the same thing, which is probably even quicker to say, is quite simply that mu is a Carlson measure for the Dirichlet space if the Dirichlet space is contained in L2 of mu. Because if the Dirichlet space is contained in L2 of mu, then the inclusion map has to be continuous. This is a closed graph theorem again. And to say that the inclusion map is continuous is exactly the, the statement that I've written here. But I think in practice, what one really uses all the time is this inequality. So I thought it was worth defining it that way. Okay, so I'll explain on the next slide what this has to do with Carlson, but just uh, let me come back to the question of multipliers and explain why this helps us with the problem of characterizing multipliers. We have the following proposition. So if I is a multiplier, if and only if, it satisfies two conditions. First of all, it should be an H infinity. We've already seen that that's a necessary condition. And secondly, phi dash, mod phi dash squared D area is a Carlson measure for the Dirichlet space. And uh, I didn't actually write out a proof of this proposition, but actually you can do it in your head. It's very easy. Um, how does one check that phi is a multiplier? Well, we need to take an F in the Dirichlet space and prove that phi f also belongs to the Dirichlet space. So calculate the Dirichlet integral of phi f. What do you get? Well, if you do that calculation, you differentiate the product phi f. And well, this is really deep stuff. The product, the derivative of the product is phi dash f plus f dash phi. And so you need to check that both of these things are square integrable. So one of the, the integrals is very easy. The mod, f, mod phi squared mod f dash squared is integrable because mod phi squared is bounded and mod f dash squared is integrable because f was originally in the Dirichlet space. But that's easy. And the other term you get is the integral of mod f squared mod phi dash squared dA. And proving that that is bounded or finite boils down exactly to saying that if you plug d mu equals mod phi dash squared dA in here, that you get something that's finite. So this is exactly the condition of being a Carlson measure. So I don't know, I probably should have written something out, but um, if you follow that, it, it really is easy. So how do we solve the problem? Well, not really, because we're now left with the problem of how to characterize Carlson measures. But this is a, a question that's of interest, not just for the problem of multipliers, but for other things as well. So it's a worthwhile question to study. Um, now, uh, the Carlson measures are so called because they were originally introduced by Carlson in the context of Hardy spaces um, as part of his proof of the Corona theorem. And in fact, what he showed was that, uh, so if I, sorry, I'm just going to go back one, one slide. Um, so a Carlson measure for H2 would simply be the same condition, but instead of taking the Dirichlet norm, you take the H2 norm here. And he showed that there was a, a nice geometric characterization of uh, these Carlson measures for H2. And here it is. So you, you, you look at uh, so-called Carlson boxes. So a Carlson box is a uh, thing like I've drawn on the, this picture here. So you have a sudden, an arc I on the unit circle. And then you, you go in for part of the, the sector that I subtends. And you choose it so that this length here, um, this length here, the length you go in, is either equal to or in some cases just proportional to the length of i. So it's uh, it's a sort of roughly a square. And uh, so the, the formal definition is what I've written here. And Carlson showed that mu is a uh, satisfies this uh, Carlson condition that we had on the previous slide. For H2, if and only if mu of any Carlson box is bounded by some fixed constant times the length of the box, the side length of the box. And actually in many, uh, in the literature, often this characterization is taken as the definition of Carlson measure, but I, I prefer to do it the way around that I've done it because for our purposes, it's more appropriate. 
Okay, so that that gives us a, a readily verifiable geometric condition to be a Carlson measure. Uh, but that's for the Hardy space. So what happens for the Dirichlet space? Uh, well, there is a, a result that has the same general form, and this is a theorem due to Andrew Wynn, uh, who was a graduate student at Oxford at the time he did this. Um, so he looked at uh, a similar type of condition. So you look at a measure of mu on the unit disk, and you look at uh, the value of the measure on a Carlson box, and you suppose that it's controlled by some function psi of the length of i. And if you take psi to be this function, one over log one over x, that gives you a necessary condition for mu to be a Carlson measure for the Dirichlet space. And if you take psi to be this more complicated thing, that is sufficient. Uh, it's probably not terribly clear, but the, the whole of this long expression here is in the denominator. So it's one over all this stuff. And there is a, a gap between these two. And notice I've written alpha is greater than one. And it really is that. I mean, if you take uh, psi to be equal to this function with some alpha between zero and one, then the condition is neither necessary nor sufficient. So there is a genuine gap here. Um, so this is a nice condition, or two nice conditions, but they don't tell the whole story. Maybe for certain purposes, they're good enough. But if you want a, a result that actually gives you a complete characterization, well, you need to formulate the hypothesis a bit differently, and it becomes, the situation becomes more, compli more complicated. So I'm going to show you one such result, and then uh, I'll mention a few others in passing. Uh, so this is a characterization, I think actually goes back uh, a long ways to Genga, 1980. So he showed that mu is a Carlson measure for the Dirichlet space, if and only if it satisfies the following condition. So instead of looking at one, uh, excuse me, instead of looking at one arc, you look at a finite number of disjoint arcs, I1 up to IN, and you form the corresponding Carlson boxes. They'll be disjoint. And you look at mu of the union of those things. So that's not a problem because they're disjoint. So mu of the union is the sum of the mu. So that's, that's easy enough to handle. But where things get more complicated is on the other side of the inequality. So this has to be controlled by the logarithmic capacity of the union. And it's not true that the capacity of the union is the sum of the capacities. It's bounded above by that sum, but it's not equal to the sum. And this makes this a very difficult condition to, to use because uh, you can compute the capacity of one arc. There's a formula for that in terms of the length. But once you start looking at two or more arcs, the capacity depends not just on the, the lengths of the arcs, but on the way that they're distributed. And it becomes a very complicated story. Um, so this is not the only such characterization. There are some others, and I'll, I'll come back and mention them at the, the end of the uh, at the end of the chapter. But rather than uh, spending too long on that, I want to instead go back to multipliers, which was the mo motivating question and indicate a, another approach to, to multipliers, which um, I would say has been more fruitful in the recent past uh, and doesn't depend on, on trying to characterize them explicitly. And in order to do that, I need to um, explain a little bit the connection between multipliers and reproducing kernels. So in general, a reproducing kernel Hilbert space is just the space, Hilbert space of functions on some set with the property that uh, evaluation at any point of that set is a continuous linear functional. And so in particular, this is true of the Dirichlet space because if you take a function of the Dirichlet space and you look at evaluation at some point of the open unit disk, that is continuous with respect to the Dirichlet norm. And just by the, the Reese representation theorem for Hilbert spaces, Evaluate uh, a continuous linear functional is given by taking the inner product with some suitably chosen element of your Hilbert space. So, in the case of the Dirichlet space, 
if I fix a W in, in the unit disk, f of W, evaluating f at W is a linear functional of f, which is given by taking the inner product of f with some suitably chosen element of the Dirichlet space, which I'll denote by kW. And in the case of the Dirichlet space, you can actually compute exactly what this is. It's not very difficult. And it's this formula here. If I were in the, the Hardy space, um, the reproducing kernel would simply be what's inside the bracket here, one over one minus W bar Z. And the fact we're in the Dirichlet space brings in, as always, a log. Um, at any rate, this, uh, this function is called the reproducing kernel for uh, the point W. And there is a, a very simple relation between multipliers and reproducing kernels given by the following proposition. I'm picking up some uh, unwanted sound. Can you switch off your mic, please? Thank you. Um, so the proposition says that if phi is a multiplier of the Dirichlet space, and we define uh, the multiplication operator by this formula, I mentioned earlier that by the closed graph theorem, this is a bounded linear operator. Then the, for any W, the reproducing kernel uh, W, this is an element of our Dirichlet space, it's an eigenvector of the adjoint of M phi. And the value of phi conjugated at W is the corresponding eigenvalue. And this is uh, a proposition with a one-line proof, so I'm going to show you the proof. Well, I guess two lines, but the essential part of the proof is one line. So take any f in the Dirichlet space and calculate its inner product with the adjoint of m phi applied to kw. So just letting uh, m phi hop over to the other side of the inner product, we get m phi f, which is just phi times f. And then that's the first equality. The second equality comes from the property that the reproducing kernel has that in a product against that, evaluate the function at W. And now essentially I reverse all those steps, but leaving the, the, the phi of W at the beginning untouched. So I write F of W as the inner product of F with KW. And then finally, the phi W I bring back into the, the second factor, which means I have to put a bar on top of it. And I get this equality, and it holds for all f in the Dirichlet space. So the, the two terms on the, the right of the inner product must coincide. And that's it. <clears throat> OK, well, that's kind of cute. Um, and actually, if you think about it a bit, we haven't really used any complex analysis in this. It's, it would work for an arbitrary reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Exactly the same argument would work. And what's really remarkable is that, in a sense, this characterizes multipliers. Because if you start off with a bounded operator on your reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and this operator has the reproducing kernel as its eigenvectors, then this is just essentially by running the argument backwards, you can prove that this operator must be the adjoint of uh, the multiplication by some multiplier. This gives a way of, of getting your hands on multipliers that's really rather simple and doesn't depend on being able to characterize them explicitly. This is really an extremely powerful technique. And really it's just based on this very simple proposition. I want to show you some applications of, of these ideas. So the first one is to uh, so-called pick interpolation. So if we're given uh, an interval of points in unit disk and an interval of target values, um, well, in the classic pick theorem, you, you ask whether there is a holomorphic function mapping the disk to itself that interpolates the Z. So it maps at ZJ to WJ. Um, so you can think of this uh, as being a sort of hardy space version where uh, instead of thinking of phi as a map from the unit disk to itself, think of it as being a map in H infinity with H infinity norm at most one. Of course, it's the same thing, but thought of that way, 
it allows a generalization to the Dirichlet space where we replace H infinity, which remember was the, the multiplier algebra of the Hardy space, we replace it by the multiplier algebra of the Dirichlet space. And you end up with uh, the following formulation. <coughs> um, can we find a, an interpolating function, which is a multiplier of multiplier norm at most one? <coughs> And excuse me, <coughs> the answer. <coughs> I lost my voice. Excuse me. So there's a the theorem is that um, you can do this if and only if this matrix is positive semi-definite. And uh, if I compare with what happens in the Hardy space case, where the the reproducing kernel is particularly simple, uh, this in a product would simply be the value of k of zi at the point zj and would correspond to having a one minus zi bar zj in the denominator. You end up with a very familiar pick condition for being able to, to solve the classical pick problem. And so Agler's theorem is a, a direct generalization of that. And well, I, I certainly don't have time to go into the proof, but the necessity part actually is a very short argument using the, the proposition we had just uh, on the previous slide about relating multipliers and reproducing kernels. The, the sufficiency depends on specific form of the Dirichlet kernel. And I, I, I think I'm right in sort of saying that originally Agler did this in the case of the Dirichlet space, uh, it also appears in a paper of Marshall and Sundberg at around the same time. And then rather quickly, it was realized that um, there was a, an abstract property of the kernel, so-called complete pick property, which one can characterize in abstract terms, which allows you to do this in much greater generality. So the Dirichlet kernel is an example of a, a kernel with the pick property, but um, there's a sort of general theory of which allows you to do this for rather general families of uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Uh, let me just rather quickly mention the problem of interpolation, interpolating infinite interpolating sequences. So uh, again, there's a, a famous theorem of Carlson that characterizes interpolating sequences in unit disks. And interpolating sequence is simply one such that given any bounded sequence of target values, you can interpolate by a bounded function on that uh, interpolating sequence. And the, the analog for the Dirichlet space do the same thing with replacing H infinity by the, the multiplier algebra. And there's a, a theorem that gives you, that characterizes these sequences. Um, it was proved, uh, by Marshall and Sundberg using ideas again, very close to what I've been talking about. Uh, Bishop gave a, another proof uh, and neither of these people, neither of these two, two teams actually published their result. And then there was a, a, a simpler published proof by Boo in, in 2005. Um, so the, the condition is, if there are actually two conditions, there's a condition in terms of Carlson measure and a sort of separation condition. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to, to skip over rather quickly to the, the last slide. I just want to mention an application of these ideas to factorization theorems. Um, so we say f is a cyclic function for the Dirichlet space if um, when you uh, look at, when you multiply f by all possible multipliers, then you get something that's dense in the Dirichlet space. Uh, I'm going to come back and discuss cyclic functions in more detail tomorrow, uh, but just for the purposes of this, uh, the statements of these theorems, I just need to define it here. Uh, it's sort of obvious that cyclic implies that the function is not vanishing everywhere because if ever f vanished at some point, then clearly whenever you multiply by something, the, the product would vanish at the same point and there would be no hope of getting a a dense set of functions in the Dirichlet space. So cyclic implies no vanishing. The converse is false. And as I say, I'm going to come back and discuss this in rather more detail tomorrow. <clears throat>
And in fact, in the case of the Hardy space, cyclic functions are characterized exactly as being the outer functions. So the, the two notions are interchangeable in, in the Hardy space case. This is, again, a consequence of Burling's inner outer factorization. <clears throat> so I just want to mention here two factorization results that are rather recent and that were proved using this general circle of ideas about uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces and complete pick kernels. So the first is a sort of rough analog of inner outer factorization that says that any function of the Dirichlet space can be uh, factored as a product of a multiplier and a cyclic function. So in the Hardy space, the, the cyclic would be outer Multiplier doesn't quite correspond to inner, it corresponds to bounded, but at least the, the idea is the same. We're sort of separating out the, the, the zeros and the, the, the multiplier part. Um, and secondly, uh, there's a, a theorem of uh, these uh, four people, Alemann, Hartz, McCarthy, Richter, that gives a, a different type of factorization, also very interesting that in the Dirichlet space, you can write F as a quotient of two multipliers with the denominator being cyclic. And the, the analog to think of here is what happens in the Hardy space uh, is that you can write any Hardy space function as the quotient of two H infinity functions where the denominator is outer. And this is uh, so-called Smirnov factorization. And the, the exact analog of this uh, works in the Dirichlet space as well. And what I think is really remarkable about, about these results is that, I mean, they were not previously known even for the very special case of the Dirichlet space, but the proofs go through for very general um, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces with this complete pick property. And actually the jury Martin result, uh, what they proved is vastly more general than what I've stated here. You can do much more than what I've, I've said, but I wanted to, to keep things simple. So my apologies to them for um, oversimplifying their results. And here is a, uh, a nice corollary of this last factorization. This was also known before, but it still it comes out rather easily. If we're given a function of the Dirichlet space, then there is a multiplier that has exactly the same zero set. And it's obvious because if you write F as a quotient of two multipliers, well, the the numerator will have exactly the same zero set as that. Uh, and so that's something that wasn't altogether obvious at the beginning, but it has the consequence that the union of two zero sets is again a, a zero set. What's the natural way to prove that? Well, you take a function that has one zero set, is it zero set? You take another function that has the other one and multiply them together. And the result is a function whose zero set is the union of the two. But to know that the, the product of the two functions, again, belongs to the Dirichlet space, you better know that one of them is a multiplier. And that's, that's what this corollary gives you. <coughs> and so just to finish with, um, I didn't have time to discuss, there are other characterizations of multipliers and, and Carlos and measures um, using uh, double integrals. These uh, were investigated in detail by Arkotsi, Rochberg and Sawyer. Um, I once remarked jokingly to uh, someone that I was always getting the inequality the wrong way around for Carlos and measures. And I was told that quite seriously, there are things, measures, where you, the, the reverse inequality is interesting. And they're called reverse Carlos and measures. And there's a, an article on, on these and their applications, a survey article by uh, Frickan, Hartman, and Ross. And finally, one other thing I didn't have time to discuss here. But again, by analogy with H infinity, you might wonder if there's an analog of the, the corona problem, uh, uh, corona theorem, I should say, and indeed there is, and uh, the, these are the references for it. So I've overrun by five minutes, I'm sorry about that, but uh, anyway, thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you, Tom. Let's thank the, the speaker. Wonderful talk. I think there are at least two remarks or questions on the chat. We have a little bit of time. 
Um, so there's one, what is the motivation behind this problem? Which problem is that? I think it's uh, referring to the interpolation problem. Oh, okay. Um, uh, well, there is a whole industry for that. Yeah, I, I mean, this is something that people have studied in detail for H infinity. And so the problem that I stated was the natural problem for the natural analog for the Dirichlet space. May Schenker has a uh, characterization of interpolating sequences for the upper half plane. Um, well, I guess this is a Mobius invariant uh, thing. So I guess the, you can just move it to the disk. Um, I don't think there's as much, you have to rephrase the condition for Carlson measures, but I, I don't think it's, it's any different in the upper half plane because the whole question is Mobius invariant. Uh, Tom, could you please share one more time your PDF file? Yes, certainly. Uh, there it is. Any other questions? I have just, uh, I think. It the, the two preprints of uh, Sandberg, um, uh, <clears throat> Marshall and Sandberg and Bishop are from the same year, aren't they? Um, 1994, I think. Uh, I was looking at this the other day and um, Bishop is certainly 94. Marshall Sandberg, I'm not too sure about. I, I kind of, for some reason, I had two dates. I mean, they would know better. They're, they're the people who okay. asked the question. Well, it's not important. Yes. They're beautiful preprints, but. Yes. Very different. From... I have a question, if I may. Please. Uh, you had the characterization of the multipliers in terms of uh, uh, being a Carlos, also being a Carlson measure for the uh, F prime square yes. the, the, it being uh, a Carlson measure. No. In, yeah. in the case of the Hardy space, uh, these conditions means that phi is in BMO. Uh -huh. So is in the dual of uh, H1. Is, is there a description, a characterization of being phi prime square the a Carlson measure for as the phi being the dual of D1 or something? Uh, I'm not sure I you fully understand. Yeah, uh, so, 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 so here, suppose you take uh, the, 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 you define D1 as the space of function whose the derivative is the uh, L1 integrable. So as, and then you take this dual. Uh, now, then my question, if this condition on the colors of measure is, can be, is equivalent saying the phi is in the dual of D1, uh, so the space so defined. Right. Okay. It's an analogy with the Hardy space situation. Right. I, so the short, short answer to that is I don't know, but there are probably people uh, listening in who do. <laughs> uh, so I'm sorry, I don't know yeah. the answer to that. Okay. If, if I can uh, try it. Is it Ma Marco who answered? Yeah, question? this is me. So Marco. No, uh, everybody. No, the, uh, the, no, no the, uh, there is an analog. Uh, because, okay, you, you can define a kind of H1 space as the weak product of the Dirichlet space uh, uh, with itself. Weak product mm -hmm. in the sense of uh, okay. Koizman, Weiss, and others. And yes. then the dual can be identified uh, with uh, functions also that the, the derivative mod square is a Carlos measure. Okay. And this is also related to Henkel operators in some. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, but you have to take the, those the weak products space. Right, weak product and uh, not product. Uh... Okay. Thank you. Uh, I see this, we've sort of overrun our time, but there is a question in the chat that I could answer very quickly. Uh, so it was asked, do we have a similar factorization theorem for d mu? 
So I assume you do mu. You mean the uh, mu is these are the Dirichlet spaces with either harmonic or superharmonic weights. And the answer is yes, because these spaces are also examples of spaces that have the complete pick property. So exactly the same technology will, will prove these factorization theorems. Thank you, Tom. Let's thank Tom again. Sorry, we went a bit too 